To have a face-to-face -face with my guest this time, I have to fly to Singapore, where she currently lives. Even though she is a familiar figure in this part of the world and often visits Indonesia, her busy schedules means catching her at the right time and the right place, in between her many activities and travels. Something I'm happy to do, as she really is a special person. Hello and welcome to Face to Face with me, I'm Daisy Anwar in a program that brings the world to your screen and where we meet people who make a difference to our lives. In this episode I talk to a supermodel, a celebrity, a face that is very familiar on television and also someone who is an echo warrior, an environmental activist and someone who cares a lot about the planet. Join me on Face to Face with Nadia Hutagalo. Most people know her as a model and a VJ with a beautiful face. But Nadia Hutagalung sees herself more as someone who wants to do something to make a difference to the world we live in. Visiting her in Singapore, Nadia takes me to attend a talk on a new conservationist project, Let Elephants Be Elephants, a project she's initiating with her zoologist friend Tammy Matson. The objective is to help stop the killing of elephants in Africa by reducing the demand for ivory in Asia. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Hi. Mm, so good to see you. Yeah, good to see you too. I can't wait to see the presentation. I know. I need to uh, get my head together and hopefully it'll be okay too. Yeah, and I yeah. see there's a lot of people coming here showing yes. great interest, obviously. Yes, it's, um, we had, uh, we're sold out. In fact, we're over, oversold the seats tonight, so that's a really good sign. Wow, yeah. that's really good. Yeah. So is this the first time that you're doing something uh, with the elephants, the let elephants be yes. elephants? Yes, it is. Um, it, it started off as just a, a, a small event. We thought we would just do it to um, generate some interest mm -hmm. and, and see where it would go from there. But it's, it's turned out much bigger than we expected. Um, again, that's really heartening. And I know you've been to Africa. Yes. And yes. Um, last year, was it this year? This year. Uh, this this year. year. But how long has it been since you've been interested in elephants? Or is this something that that you got drawn into because of Tammy? Or is it something that well, I been we've interested in? I've always been interested in elephants. I guess, again, I, I, I have to say that my mom is my inspiration. I grew up with elephant statues and elephant paintings all mm. over the house. Um, and then when I met Tammy, we just she started sharing about mm. um, the plight of the elephants. And I said, I just need to go. I need to go and learn for this, learn about this for myself and, and mm. see it for my, with my own eyes. Um, and so Tammy, after the, the initial talks, she cut back to me and she said, you know what, why don't we go? And I said, you know what, why don't we go? Mm. We should go. And um, then I realized, you know, there's an opportunity here and why don't I bring a crew with me? So I mustered up some of my friends and, mm. and we took a crew and we went to Africa and we met the world's top uh, elephant um, scientists and conservationists and, uh, and people who have been working in the field of elephants. Um, and got their um, perspective on what's happening with the mm. elephants and very clearly Asia is to blame. Because of the demand? Because of the demand. So is, is the demand of ivory s is still on the rise or has it um, declined over the years as people got more and more aware that it's, you know, yeah, this is, politically this is incorrect, environmentally terrible? And yeah, you would think so. I mean, uh, that's the general consensus. 
you know, everyone thinks, and, and I think especially of our generation or older, you know, they've, they've seen the lobbying before mm. of the ivory trade and, and they probably think, okay, you know, it's all been done already. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, the ivory trade now is worse than it's ever been. Really? It's worse than it's ever, ever been. 2012 saw uh, the highest number of elephants killed for their ivory um, and there's around 30,000 elephants a year being killed mm -hmm. for their ivory. And in 2013, in the first six months, we saw 2012's numbers already uh, uh, wiped, you know, you know, more than 2012 numbers. So um, it is really critical right now. And mm -hmm. Africa can't fight this anymore on the ground in Africa. Mm -hmm. Even uh, at this stage, they're actually um, uh, giving weapons to the rangers, mm -hmm. but that's just going to create a bloody war. So it has to be fought here in Asia. Mm -hmm. We have to just stop the demand. And the demands are, uh, and the number of elephants are diminishing. Yes, the time because of greatly. Now, so what are you hoping to get from you know, doing this presentation and getting people to come and, and watch and, and listen to you? What, what, what are the final objectives? to get what kind of involvement from um, everybody? The final objective uh, for tonight would obviously be um, support for our campaign, mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, either in terms of sponsorship or, or partnerships, um, but ultimately just to share. Tonight I really don't have, I'm not here to sell anything. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just here basically to say, look, this is what we're doing. Mm -hmm. um, this is the situation and... Um, to raise awareness. To raise awareness. And, and this is what we, what we are doing from our side. Okay, well, I'm really, really excited to see um, and also I think because in Indonesia, you know, are the numbers of elephants uh, that are dying because yes. of poachers and because of human encroachments basically yes. is, is mm. quite sad. So yes. I think you've got lots of guests there waiting for you. Yes. You should go and say hello yes. to them. What time will it start? Uh, it should be 7 o'clock. 7 o'clock. Yes. Last year, up to 36,000 elephants were killed for their ivory. At the current rate of poaching, African elephants could face extinction in the wild by 2025. Apparently, the majority of people in the world don't realize that the elephant must die or be killed in order for the ivory to be taken. Both Nadia and Tammy believe that if consumers are educated on this, demand for ivory as jewelry and luxury goods will go down. Instead, if anything, rising wealth and rising demand for ivory consumer items, particularly in countries in Asia, have encouraged the killings of large numbers of elephants in Africa. Nadia's passion and concern for the environment has gone on for a while now. Her website, called Green Kampong, is a way of sharing her green initiatives with others and to provide an online resource for those looking for information on sustainable living. Together with her husband, Desmond Cole, the website, started in 2007 in Singapore, posts articles on conservation, green business, design and architecture, food, fashion and beauty, as well as science and technology, and how to practice green living. Nadia's eco-friendly family house in Bukit Tima is Singapore's first ever eco home built from scratch, a project that took three years to complete. Most of the materials used in the construction came from sustainable sources, bought either locally or within the region to reduce the carbon footprint. It's obvious that for Nadia, green living is not just a good idea, but a choice and a way of life that can be practiced at the simplest level. So Nadia, you're taking me to your favorite organic shop. Yes, this is uh, in my hood, and uh, it's where I like to get all of my fresh produce for juicing and, and cooking for the family and everything. It's a great shop. Okay. So this is where I get all of my energy and health and mm -hmm. vitality, um, usually stocking up on uh, good produce for juices. Mm -hmm. um, I juice every day. 
Every day, every day, every day I have veggie juice. But um, just you, or do you also feed your family? The family as well. Mm -hmm. um, so even the kids have gotten into juicing. My youngest surprisingly has juices, and recently she had um, a case of hand, foot, and mouth disease, mm -hmm. uh, and she, so she had a lot of ulcers in her mouth. But still, she would put the, the spinach in and all mm -hmm. her greens and make a smoothie because it was the only way that she could she could get any nutrients. Mm -hmm. uh, so they're I guess they've grown up that way and they're used to it. Okay, so tell me what are your, the favorite produce that you normally buy on a regular basis? Some of the things that I love, uh, and they're not that easy to come by everywhere, uh, things like kale, which is incredibly good for you, yakon, mm -hmm. which is considered to be the king of roots. It's a Peruvian root. It mm -hmm. looks a bit like sweet potato. Um, it's fantastic for moderating sugar levels and great for diabetics and very good for preventing things like colon cancer. Wow. Really, really good. I'm, I'm impressed. I mean, uh. do you cook? Yes. Every day for yourself and for the family? Um, ideally, yes. Ideally, yes. But um, given that uh, sometimes my schedule can be a little bit crazy, mm -hmm. um, it, doesn't, it doesn't always happen that way. But um, my help is at home. We've, we've spent a lot of time uh, mm. learning about cooking and what's the best way to, to feed us all. So and always you, get And you make food. sure that the the stuff that you use is all organic and healthy? Um, mostly organic um, and there's, there's various reasons for that and um, you know they say that uh, there's a, there, there was an article that came out I think this year that said there's no difference between organic food and, and non-organic food mm -hmm. and I think in terms of nutrients that there, there might be a case there but in terms of whatever it's added to the produce, mm -hmm. there there is no argument. You know, you can't be feeding yourself pesticides and chemicals and and genetically modified food because mm -hmm. there's no way that, that any of that is good for you. And one of the interesting things that that I always talk about is the fact that if you want to live a kinder lifestyle, if you want to live a, a, a more planet friendly lifestyle, um, the easiest thing to do to adjust your carbon footprint mm -hmm. is to eat less meat. Mm -hmm. Which you are doing. You don't eat meat much? I don't eat much meat. Uh, occasionally I have no choice because I have a lot of allergies, mm -hmm. food sensitivities. So sometimes when I'm, I'm shooting or on location, then, mm -hmm. then I will eat some, some meat. Mm -hmm. And your children actually enjoy eating I mean, are they not sometimes, you know, children can get quite fussy about what they eat and are they quite happy to... Well, my two eldest I don't really have much control over, <laughs> uh, you know, the two, two boys. Uh, our youngest is, uh, she's still vegetarian. And uh, how about in terms of, I mean, you have such a busy schedule and preparing mm. these foods must take an awful long time, especially when you have to do them yourself. How do you fit them in then? Um, well, I, 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 one of the easiest things that I do is always um, juice and I make juices and smoothies mm -hmm. uh, and that doesn't really take much time um, and get, I get a lot of sustenance from that and the smoothies can contain various nuts and oils mm -hmm. and, and, and seeds and, uh, and, and um, proteins mm -hmm. and things like that and then my juices are all my veggies as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, so if I'm really under pressure and running, running tight on time, that's my go-to. Uh, but I really do try to focus on food. Um, it is one of my greatest passions and uh, because I'm a foodie, because I have so many food sensitivities and restrictions based on ethics mm -hmm. and, and environmental reasons, I have to focus so much on food, otherwise I'm left with yeah. nothing to eat. But has it helped you health-wise, <coughs> keeping Ab your energy, keeping your shape and keeping yes. you healthy? Absolutely. I recently did a, um, a very extensive uh, blood test, blood workup, and looking out for everything, you know, all the cancers, stroke, uh, and everything was low. Everything was low, so uh, cancer, no cancer markers, no markers for stroke, no markers for, mm -hmm. for um, um, uh, heart disease, um, cholesterol was low, sugars were low, everything was good. Mm -hmm. And you, I see that when you tweet, you tweet a lot about your juices. And what kind of feedback have you been getting? Are a lot of people curious and say, you know, Nad, I really want to follow your lifestyle or... A lot. Um, um, a lot of really great response to the juices uh, and for me it's just a little way of, of sharing good health. You know, for me, I, I do the things that I do only in, with the hopes that I can inspire people to be 
happy and to be healthy uh, and, and have an educated uh, way of, of making decisions about how they live their lives. Making the right choices, yes. especially when the planet actually needs that kind of yes. choices we make. So and this is something you picked up or you, you actually go out of your way to learn about these I dishes? I go out of my way to learn about these things because to me nutrition is really important. Mm -hmm. uh, wellness is also really important. Uh, so, because I've had to struggle with mm -hmm. food, um, and I know that a lot of people do, a lot of people um, also don't know that they have so many food sensitivities and end up feeling unwell and lethargic mm -hmm. and bloated and tired and puffy and all of those things, and they don't realize that it's all to do with to do food. With the stuff they put in Sinuses, their bodies, yeah. migraines, you know, all of those things. And so I, it's really helped your allergies? It's yeah. really, really helped my allergies. Okay, well, let's continue with your shopping. And let's look around the shop. Yeah. Born and brought up in Australia, Nadia grew up surrounded by nature and influenced by her Australian mother, Diane, an art school teacher who loves planting different kinds of vegetables around the house and a positive force in her life. Nadia's modelling career started when she was only 12 years old when she joined Sydney Modelling Agency with the intention of earning some pocket money. Her rare beauty a mixture between an Australian mother and a Batak father made her an instant hit and soon she was being jetted off to Tokyo on modelling assignments. She became a household name when in 1995 she was MTV's Asia pioneer DJ entertaining over 70 million households across Asia making her face one of the most well-known in that decade. the lifestyle product and I mean, Nadia you know shops like this you mm. know health food shop and organic shops is actually uh, you know the exception rather than the rule you actually have to go out of your way to find uh, you know these shops that sell uh, environmentally alternative, products, alternative yeah. products now I see you as someone and you are well known as um, someone who promotes environmentally uh, and sustainable living mm. uh, I like I think uh, somebody describes you as an echo warrior, which I think it's, it's a perfect way of, of describing mm. your efforts and, and your interests. And, and the house itself, when you say mm. greenhouse, I'm, I'm just trying to sort of have an image in my mind, especially yeah. in Singapore, a house that is green. Yeah. What does it mean? Does it mean that the, the materials are environmentally friendly, the energy use and the, water? Uh, yeah, we, we very successfully built a passive house um, passive house means very little need for heating or cooling. Mm -hmm. um, from the very beginning, from the, the directional facing of the house uh, to the materials that we chose uh, to put in the house, the technologies that we used, um, even get down to a termite solution mm. that doesn't use uh, poison. Um, our swimming pool is a mineral water swimming pool. Okay, so you can drink from the swimming pool. You could, do you could my cats drink from the swimming pool, which is a good sign. I think if my cat is mm -hmm. happy to drink from the pool, that's a good thing. Um, and, and people joke that we backed up uh, the Evian truck and dumped the water in. But no, it's just normal water and it's the filtration system that's different. Mm -hmm. And when you have a house that's built in, uh, in, a, in a city, an urban environment, um, a densely populated urban environment, you don't want to have all of that chlorine mm -hmm. being heated by the sun and off-gassing into the house. Um, so that's... that's wow, the, about so the you pool. really have to think things through. Yeah. But in the long run, is it sort of cheaper in, in terms of Absolutely. paying electricity bills? And Absolutely. We have... We built... Um, when we built our home, we aimed for it, for it to be a three-generation home, uh, which is then, of course, reducing everyone's carbon footprint. It didn't work out that way, um, but we did build a house that was big enough for the three generations. So we have a three-story house mm -hmm. with uh, six, six to seven bedrooms and a 20-meter swimming pool. And 
our power bills are the same as a small two-story inter-terrace with no swimming pool and two, two or three bedrooms. So it's been really successful in that sense. Nadia, I'm sure a lot of people, and especially you know, there's more in increasing awareness about how important it is to take care of the planet, to you know, live uh, an environmentally friendly or green lifestyle. But uh, some of the sort of perhaps um, it, it just sounds you know it's hard, and if you have to buy you know things organic, it's expensive, and if you have to build a house, it sounds like a lot of work. Now, what's what's your message to just encourage more people to make those kind of choices and stick to those yeah. choices the way that you have done and you are doing and you're thinking ahead for your children and your children's children's future. It's actually really, really simple. You know, um, aside from uh, reducing meat intake, the best thing that you can do is to just consume less. So people say, oh, you know, you know, mm -hmm. being organic or being, being eco-friendly is expensive. Mm -hmm. It's not the case. You, because you simply just consume less, you know, when it comes to, to the way you live your life, the way you consume uh, household products, mm -hmm. uh, you can even make your own, you know, vinegar, baking soda, salt. All of these things do perfectly well at home, mm -hmm. uh, cleaning the house. Um, and things like uh, even the way I dress, you know, I have a, a very simple staple wardrobe that is, is a classic and it's timeless. You know, I have shoes mm -hmm. that I still have from 10 years ago that I can still wear now because they're classics. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's just about consuming less. It's about uh, making wise uh, decisions and purchases and understanding how products are produced uh, before they get to you, how they get to you, um, the companies that produce them, um, and and just 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 being wiser. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're doing, educating people mm -hmm. on, for example, you know that if you buy ivory products, mm -hmm. elephants die yeah. in order to, uh, for the ivory to you know be taken. And the other thing is, you know, the shark fins. You know, it's, yes. it, enjoy the shark fins, but remember, sharks die, and, yes. and sharks are an in the endangered species. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that uh, you are uh, well known for, and I think it's a great achievement because it's a global initiative, mm. is you are the global ambassador for Earth Hour. Yes. And it's, it's amazing how that movement has taken off, you know, now mm. when we have that 60 minutes of the whole world switching electricity off and mm. then suddenly it's amazing the amount of energy that we can save. Now, how, how do you feel about being part of that? Um, well, I think Earth Hour... Um has grown from strength to strength every year. And it started with an hour of inspiration and has grown to become this incredible platform for change and people power. And it is, it is, it started with Earth Hour, then it became Earth Hour Plus, so going beyond the hour. Mm -hmm. And then the I Will If You Will campaign kicked in, which is basically I'm daring you to, to, to save the planet or you dare me to save the planet. Um, where people give challenges. So I, mm -hmm. I say if 10,000 people give up plastic bags and straws for a year, I'll go diving with mm -hmm. a shark. You know? so, and it and it's becomes fun that way. You know, mm -hmm. the, I think the ways and, and, and the messages now in conservation and, and getting people to, to adjust their lifestyle need to be different. Uh, and it needs to have a fresh approach. So what's your, what's your vision of the perfect planet Earth that we'll be very happy to hand over to our children. Well, you see, the thing is this. I don't think that we can just say everybody needs to care about the environment. It, it is an unfortunate reality that it's simply not going to be the case. We have poverty and education issues and health issues and population issues uh, that we need to think of. The truth is it's all interconnected. Mm -hmm. Right, it's really all interconnected. So it, it's, it's not so much that you go out there and say, oh, go green, because that, that it's kind of like a message yeah. from many, many years ago, right? You know, it, the community needs mm -hmm. to be supported. The community needs to be happy. The community needs to be fed and educated. Only then can they think about issues outside themselves. People also need to be uh, uh, supported in, in a manner that they can 
think about morals and ethics. In countries where corruption is rife and, and is, is the norm, how do you change these mindsets? Mm -hmm. How do you change the bar, you know, what, what sets the bar of, of success? You you know, normally people think in terms of economic success. Yeah. Know. But, you know, I think we should go and have a cup of tea somewhere. Sure. Yeah, yeah it's a great okay. idea. Let's go and look for somewhere. Recently, Nadia is once again pulled back into the modelling world. This time, as host of the well-known regional TV show, Asia's Next Top Model. I have a feeling, however, that it is her interest in the environment that fuels her passion. And whether creating a line of jewellery with recycled gold, becoming Singapore's ambassador for WWF Earth Hour, and being nominated for the International Green Awards for the Most Responsible International Celebrity 2012, alongside with other global celebrities such as George Clooney and Penelope Cruz, Nadia is increasingly getting recognised for her green activities and ethical lifestyle. To be sure, there is a lot more depth to her than the familiar and beautiful face that she's generally known by, whether on the screen or in the magazines. So, while we're waiting for our tea, let's yes. continue our little chat now. Echo Warrior, I think, it's a, you know, it's a great um, description of you, but of course most of the audience would recognise you as a model, you know, supermodel, somebody they see on television, and MTV, and lately hosting the Asian Next Top Model. I mean, how... With the modelling world, um, which is very much a part of you and your career, how, how does that fit in now that you are hosting the Asia Next Top Model, grooming young would-be models who dream of being somebody like Nadia Hutagalu? How does that feel? Well, when I first was um, offered the role uh, to become the host and judge of Asia's Next Top Model, it was something that I, I really took my time to decide whether I would take it or not. Um, and because whatever I do, I, I sort of commit to things fully, you know, with, with my whole self. Uh, and don't do things halfway. And um, I had to really figure out my motivation for doing it. And, and, and what it is, is that I hope to bring to these girls, the best in the industry, uh, so that they can set out on the right foot, you know, and to have the best start that they can to their careers. Um, it's a lot of pressure. It's also a very stressful, stressful role because the girls, at least the girls in Cycle One, at least, all really wanted to win, mm -hmm. uh, with the exception of. of of one or two, but generally they all really wanted to win. So it's very, very emotional. Mm -hmm. Because what you don't see is the tears. Mm. You know, each girl that we send home, she cries, you know, and it's, it's, and I'm the one sending these girls home. So it was very stressful, you know. Uh, far more emotionally uh, um, uh, taxing than I thought a reality show about modeling could be. Then how do you see yourself? I mean, you've, you've done the modeling and then you've done the TV and the entrepreneurial um, side of you and now there's the, the echo warrior, the being an environmental activist. How, how do you see uh, yourself in terms of how you've evolved? Um, I just see that I'm constantly growing, you know, and I think that has a lot to do with my hunger for knowledge. Mm -hmm. and I guess my desire to always be the best version of me. It seems like there's so much to do. Mm -hmm. and, and if I don't do it, you know, what am I going to do? You know, so it just, it just seems like the right thing. Okay, I'm just going to keep, keep on going, keep moving and, and keep, uh, keep, keep bettering myself. Mm -hmm. You're a happy person. <clears throat> I am in pursuit of happiness. 
um, I think for someone to say that they're truly happy needs to they need to be able to really identify what makes them happy is it temporary happiness is it a happiness that will actually ultimately cause suffering you know um, or is it a happiness that comes from from non-material things that come from within from doing something meaningful in your life so that's the happiness that that I'm striving for um, Are you getting closer to finding that meaning? I think you're on the right path. I, well, I'm on the path. I hope to be on the path. Um, but, you know, sometimes we get so caught up in the practical things that we need to deal with in life that the path gets a bit foggy, right? But it doesn't mean that, we've, <laughs> that we, we, we don't have the intention to be on the path. Um, so, yeah, I guess, I guess I'm... I'm working towards it. You have three children. Yes. Who would you like them to enjoy when they grow up? What kind of people would you like them to be? I just want them to be the best versions of themselves. You know, I don't have concrete goals for them. I don't think I say, oh, well, you need to be a doctor or a lawyer or a banker. You need to be incredibly successful, you need to be able to do business and be an entrepreneur, no. And I've never been one who's focused on, on grades either. So for me, it's, um, it's, it's important that they have the key things like morals and ethics and compassion and kindness. Uh, and they can be engaged members of, of, of society, you know. Those are the things that are important to me. And, and I'll do whatever I can to support that growth in them. And when you look at the past, um, you know, what kind of lessons have um, you learned? And, um, and how, I mean, how do you see you know, the, the Nadia who was a young girl mm. and then the Nadia now? I think that the lessons that I've learned, there are many, uh, but the greatest lessons that I've learned are to maintain dignity, no matter what happens. Mm -hmm. To let go of things that are beyond our control. Things are never things are never what they seem. So you can never really judge, and you can have preconceived ideas about things, but they're usually wrong. Mm -hmm. So you just have to go along with things, you know, it's like, okay, this is, this is how it is today and maybe tomorrow it'll be different and we'll see, we'll take it. Because otherwise life becomes too stressful, you know. Mm. Are you a spiritual person? I'm definitely a spiritual person. Um, there are a few pillars in my life that I hold key, and that's family, my uh, environmental advocacy and conservation work that I do, the Nadia work, and my spiritual life. So these are the these are the the four things that are, I try to work my life around. And the spirituality is what grounds me, and I think it's it's. It's especially important in today's society mm -hmm. where everything is so fast-paced and people are grasping for success. There's a real fight for um, basic needs and, and things can get ugly, you know. And I think if you have a sense of spirituality that helps, you to, helps to remind you about ethics, morals, humanity, passion, you know, and, and even if we get busy, when we stop and we have a moment to, to recall those core tenets mm -hmm. of what a human should be, you know, then we can carry on again, you know, because I think if we don't have that, we can get lost so easily, we can get distracted so easily, we can get swayed by 
by so many things. Mm. And this is the kind of things that you try to impart to your children, educate them as well, just you know, have this. We do, we do have really meaningful conversations actually mm. with the kids and my, my middle son actually really surprises me sometimes. Not surprises me, but really, you know, he says things and I'm like, that's, that's what mm -hmm. parenting is about. It's not about you coming home and showing me you've got 90 or 100 at school. Top in math. Top in math. It's about you coming home and telling me, uh, or having discussions about kindness, or, or, or doing things like when, we were, in, um, when mm -hmm. we were in Africa and we went to visit the Maasai, the Maasai village, I told him, I said, why don't you take photos? Because he loves to take photos. He's 11 year old and he loves photography. And I told him, I said, you have your iPod, take photos. He says, mom, I don't want to take it out here. But not because he didn't want to lose it, but because he knew that this was an item that was considered to be expensive and he didn't want to show off in front of mm. the, oh. the, 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 these, very the considerate. Masai kids. Yeah. Very, very considerate. And that to me is a win. Mm. That to me means more than good grades. This is something that you see yourself you know, grown into, evolved into, as you get older? You know, it's funny because there are these certain messages, mm -hmm. or, or, or principles, rather, that, that I, I'm trying to live by. And if I look back, even 15 years ago, 20 years ago, um, they're not far from the thoughts that I had then. And the questions that so I the was seeds asking. were already there. The seeds were already there, and even from a very very young age, even from as young as five years old or younger, I was already asking questions about the the universe, God, religion. You know, I can remember being very very young, uh, only in year one or year two, primary school, SD, and I was lying on my trampoline in Australia in my backyard at night and in the countryside. So you can see all of the stars. You can even see satellites mm. moving across the sky. And I was lying there and I was thinking, if God made everything, and I had this vision of, of like a genie in a bottle, mm -hmm. and I had this vision of God coming out of an earthen pot, but God made everything. So who made the pot? And that was at that age. You know, and then in my, in my early 20s, all of my books were about religion, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, uh, and, and questioning everything. So, a lot of the questions and then the beliefs that, I, that started to form then, now are becoming more robust. In 2009, Nadia was voted one of Singapore's top 20 most influential people by CNN. And that same year, she was also awarded the title Best Host TV Host by Elle magazine, a testament to her staying power in a tough industry. Nadia was also voted as one of Asia's leading trend makers by Asia Week magazine, alongside with the Dalai Lama, Michelle Yeoh and Cho Yun Fat for her special ability to inspire and fascinate. With all the achievements that she has reached so far and at a relatively young age, I'm curious to know what lies next for Nadia Utagalum. Well, that's when you were little, you were lying looking at the sky. Now say the present day Nadia lying on the ground looking at the stars, what would go through her mind? Oh, this is a luxury, <laughs> to be honest with you. Uh, I, I, that would be, that sounds really ideal, actually, uh, to be able to have that opportunity to lie down there and look at the stars. In fact, we did, actually, in Africa uh, this year uh, when I was there filming for that Elephants Be Elephants. Um, I went back a second time with my family. We got a puncture and the, the, all the phones couldn't work. We were in the middle of nowhere and then my husband and I, we just had to get out and, and lie on the top of the car and look at the stars. And it was like, oh, this is not so bad. This is not so bad. But in terms of philosophically, a very deep sense of gratitude. A 
a very, very deep sense of gratitude, being thankful for where I am today and that I'm alive and that I have my family and the blessings that I have in my life. And I'm thankful for this opportunity to be talking to you, Nadia, yes. and it's been a wonderful day we spent together and I'm, you've inspired me and I'm sure we'll inspire a lot of people in your life. So good luck. Thank you so much. With all the work that you do and you know the wonderful contribution that you're making to you. the planet. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. In everything that she does, from the food that she eats and cooks, the house that she builds, the causes that she champions, I find in Nadia Huta Darling someone who is truly committed and passionate about making the earth a better place to live for us all. And that's all for tonight's episode. Don't forget to join me next month when we meet another figure who makes a difference to our lives here on Face to Face with Daisy Anwar, bringing you the world.